So let's just go ahead and get started. For those of you who are new to this, my name is uh, Crystal Stokes. And today we're gonna to be talking about the power of personality, the Enneagram and client breakthroughs. So as I'm going through this talk today, you can feel free to make questions and comments as we go. Um, I will take some of the questions that are applicable to the moment right then and there, but others I may wait until the end to address. So feel free to just pop those questions in the box and I'll be keeping an eye on those um, as we move forward. Um, and also at the very end of this talk, if you all wanna stick around, there's gonna be a very, very short poll, only five questions. And it's really helpful to us if you answer them because it helps us improve the quality of these talks going forward. So if you don't mind hanging out, then please do. So let's go ahead and move forward. Again, the talk today is the power of personality, the Enneagram and client breakthroughs. And this is just a little bit of my background and gives you an understanding of why I'm speaking about this today. Uh, most importantly is the fact that I trained with David Daniels of Stanford University who is one of the pioneers in the Enneagram. <clears throat> He's no longer with us, but he was an excellent mentor for me. And so what I'll be sharing with you today is a lot of what I learned from Dr. Daniels. And at the very end of the presentation, you'll see here, I'll also be providing you with the Stanford Inventory, a link, and also his book, where you can go to find out more about the Enneagram in case you are interested in using this with your clients or for yourself. You'll have those tools today at the end of the talk. So to start with, we're going to dive into the nine Enneagram types. And I'll say before we get into that, that this system is, is a bit complex and there's many different aspects to the Enneagram. So for those of you who are seasoned in the Enneagram, this will be um, a, just a nice overview for you. For those of you who, who are beginners, this gives you a taste of one of the core components, which are the nine personality types. But there's a lot more, so there's um, different aspects to this system that if you go down the rabbit hole of the Enneagram, you will be introduced to that we're not covering to the, today. So the scope of this is limited just to the nine types, and my goal is to help you see how you can connect this to your work with clients and facilitate breakthroughs or work through stuck points. So here's an image of what the Enneagram looks like. Uh, there are the nine points going around a circle with the type nine being on the very top. You'll notice that they're broken into different color categories and those colors represent what we call the three centers, where the red color would represent uh, the body center, uh, the green on this diagram represents the heart center, and the blue represents the head or the mind. Again, we're not gonna get into what that means today, but I thought that'd be helpful to start uh, as an entry point. So let's get ready for those nine types and just dive right in. Starting with the first type, type one, which we'll refer to today as the perfectionist. Now each of the types will have a core belief. This is the most important aspect to start with when you're working with any particular person. So if you're trying to discover their type or maybe you've already tested them and they do know what their type is, focusing on this core belief can be really helpful because this is often the number one thing that keeps clients stuck. So the core belief for the type one, I must be disciplined and do things the right way. You can just imagine the polarity there, the fixation on doing it the right way and what is their definition of right and wrong and working with, are there ways to be more flexible with that definition? So when you're trying to identify a type one, some of the things you can look for is that they'll have very high standards uh, for themselves. And they take a lot of pride in doing things the right way. Many of the ones that I've worked with are the type of person that uh, they, either, they wouldn't maybe till 10 p.m. when even the boss or the owner of the company went home at five. And they stay because for them it's the right thing to do and, and they find it important to uphold their own level of integrity. They're also really good at seeing what's wrong and how things can be improved. Like their radar is always scanning for what could be better. So they love improvement. They also have a really strong inner critic. And this is something that may go unnoticed to an observer. But when you're meeting with somebody and you suspect they may be a one, um, asking them, you know, what's your internal dialogue like? How do you treat yourself? What's the, what's the thought process that's going on here? You may uh, stumble upon that really strong inner critic that is indicative of a type one. So 
when we have difficulties in relationships and a person comes in and says, my husband's a type one and he's just so harsh and critical of me, what we notice is that the critic within that other person, the type one, is actually much stronger than what's being um, projected onto other people. So that's also a rich area to work with if you have a client who's a type one, helping them identify their inner critic and soften their inner critic will then naturally create more softness and gentleness with those they interact with. Another aspect of the type one uh, is they have trouble giving themselves pleasure or engaging in fun because they're really just busy focusing on doing what's right. And just like the example I gave of a person staying at work till 10 p.m., they may have missed out on fun time with their family and friends or leisure activities or even self-care. And lastly, they may come across as critical or demanding in the things that they want done right. And again, that's not their, their um, they don't mean to come across that way, but to them, it's just that they're focused on what needs to be done and they forget the nuances of the social graces at times. Now there's a lot more to the type one. Today, this is just a very broad view of each type. So please know that as you dig into the material and the resources, you will see um, a lot more depth in each character as you learn more. So moving on to the type two, this one we call the helper. And the type two's core belief is, I must take care of others first or I will be abandoned. So imagine that feeling of the fear of being abandoned if I'm not continuously watching out for what your needs are and taking care of you. So as you can imagine, we see a lot of these people in the helping professions and as therapists, as nurses, as teachers, but they can be anywhere in any type of, um, of role. But wherever they are, they're going to really enjoy helping others. And they come across as a very, um, like a high energy type. They tend to be um, slightly more extroverted and have more energy and almost like a bubbly personality. Um, type two is more of a quintessential feminine type, but men definitely are twos as well. So I want to highlight that. Any gender can be any type. Um, so next, points to note is that this type feels they have a really strong radar for the needs of other people. So they could just meet you and read you and say, I know what you need. And they love to put others' needs ahead of their own. And they have a really hard time asking for help. So this is the person um, that may run around all day, taking care of work, taking care of their kids, going to get in the dry cleaning, running every errand. And then they say, you know what? I forgot to eat today. I didn't even take care of my basic need. And they may have trouble saying, honey, could you cook dinner tonight? I'm just too tired. That may be really hard for them. Deep down, they sometimes will feel resentful that they're giving so much and they're not getting it back. But it's hard for them to say that out loud. And they will tend to become emotional and maybe even demanding, especially with those people close to them, when their feelings are not heard or appreciated. And the last thing to note with the type two is they're very relationship oriented. Whereas a type one was oriented around getting things done and doing the right thing, a type two will be very focused on their relationships. Type three is called the achiever. And when I was working with Dr. Daniels, he noted that the United States has like a type three archetype to it. So you could say that we live in a three nation. And so as you read this, you yourself, if you are in the United States, may identify with aspects of this and say, oh yes, like I, I feel that too. And even if it's not your core type, you may still have some of this just from living in a culture that is a three culture. So again, type three, we call it the achiever. achiever. And the core belief here is if I'm not achieving or doing, I am worthless. So they derive their sense of value and worth from achieving and doing and getting things done. Sometimes we generally call type C human being and human being. So some points with type three are that um, they, they feel their value is very much based on what they accomplish. So they put a lot of energy into their work. And this can be, uh, you think of a student that wants to get the perfect grade or the athlete that wants to you know, win, the, win the, the goal or win the game. Um, making sure you get that promotion at work, making sure you handle every single situation the best, and getting rewards and getting that positive feedback is really, really important to a type three. Now, since they're so busy, they tend to not have much time for self-reflection, so they're usually forward-moving and future-focused, and they don't spend a lot of time looking back or even reflecting on 
how do I even feel in this moment? They're just busy being focused on what they need to do next. Um, let's see, next, they really do not feel comfortable doing nothing. Like that to them is just not an option. They love to be productive and they tend to feel very anxious if they don't have something to do. They don't like to be um, still or quiet or unproductive. Next, it's very important for them to project an image of success. The type three uh, is very good at reading different situations and adjusting, almost like a chameleon, how they present themselves in each situation in order to appeal to that, that group. So if they're um, with their teacher, they may be the perfect pupil. If they're with their sports team, they're the perfect athlete. If they're at work, they're the best worker. When they're with their partner, they're just a quintessential partner. So they really work hard to maintain this kind of moving image throughout different areas in order to appear successful. They're also extremely failure avoidant. Failure is just not an option. If they find they're starting to try something new and they're not right away good at it, there's a tendency to just want to give up. And I think I mentioned this before that approval and affirmations are super important to this type. They really love positive feedback and that really drives and encourages them to keep moving and keep working hard. So for those of you listening that are therapists, you can probably already imagine, again, the polarities that are happening here um, where we can bring more balance to this type by helping them to learn to enjoy stillness, to find their value beyond their achievements, um, and, and to be more self-reflective. And what you'll find as you learn more about the Enneagram and various sources, there are many different growth paths that are suggested for each type, which we're not getting into today. But um, for instance, if you go to the Enneagram Institute website, they have the growth path information for each type, which is very helpful when you're working with clients. The type four, we call this one the romantic. And the core belief of this type is that there's something missing. So whereas with type two and three having this kind of high energy, the type four will be a, a bit more reserved and definitely more introspective. This of all the types is the most emotional of types. So the most connected with their emotional experience. And as we know, emotions are constantly changing up and down, up and down. So to the romantic, that's their life is this up and down experience of feeling emotions and sensing that if I could just find that one missing thing, I'll finally feel better. Now their emotions are felt very deeply, more so than many other people. So sometimes they've a type four uh, romantic will, will notice that others don't meet their intensity of feelings. And so they can feel a bit of a, of a, a lack of being met in that intensity. They really value authenticity and the freedom to express themselves. I'll notice this a lot when I work in corporate settings where there may be a type four within the team that feels that they are kind of stunted by the corporate umbrella that has them working in a very specific way and they just wish they could have more freedom of expression. And some fours have um, a, a great way of expressing themselves in the way they dress. So they may have really cool glasses or they have a very like obvious style to the way they, they wear their clothes or their hair. And so that's another way to kind of pick out a type four in the crowd. Some people may say that type fours are overly dramatic or sensitive, because again, they do feel more deeply than um, many other types. And they tend to have this sense that they are different from others and kind of misunderstood, like a bit of a black sheep. They often resonate with that word. And they can also get lost in their fantasies and just kind of longing for what could be and they forget to appreciate the present moment and often struggle with procrastination too because they're kind of lost in that fantasy um, and they're just waiting to find the missing thing before they can move on with life. So again, for those of you who are therapists, you're probably already brainstorming ways you could work with this person, but just being able to meet this person here is what I've just said. If they think you can set, that sets a beautiful foundation for transformative work because they feel really seen. And that's, of course, one of the most important parts of a good therapeutic relationship. Now type five is called the investigator. And this type has the core belief that I must be capable, private, and self-sufficient to avoid being drained or intruded upon. So this type of person has a sense of their own healthy boundary and what they want that to be. Often as kids, the type fives will report that they 
had their own kind of space in the house, maybe it was their bedroom, and they really didn't like it when that was intruded upon. So they liked the sense of my space and my time. Now this type um, is also sensitive to being intruded upon, uh, not just in, in a space sense, but also when it comes to their time and their energy. So if they are in a situation that demands a lot of energy, they're gonna wanna protect themselves from that. So at times this type can be labeled or misconceived as an introvert, but they aren't necessarily introverts. They may just have a bit of a, a boundary that's a bit further out, but they still may enjoy social interaction and be energized by that and be an extrovert. So this type would rather detach and observe their feelings rather than feeling their feelings. So being a head type, this is a very analytical type that will say, okay, I'm, I'm analyzing what I'm feeling. I'm trying to have a logical response to it, but I don't want to drop in and feel it. I'd rather not. So if they're dealing with sadness, they may say, well, here are the reasons that I might be sad, and this is what happened, but, and, and this is what I need to do to move on from it, but I'm not going to linger and just stew in my feelings of sadness. That would just be terrible. So they like to analyze and stay in the, the, the realm of just cool and collected thinking. Now, this type considers themselves uh, somewhat quiet and analytical. They, they appreciate their analytical skills and they just really love alone time because they have a very rich ability to cultivate fantasies and thoughts in their head. I had a, one client who said they, the type five who called this my tinker chamber and I love to be upstairs in my tinker chamber. It's my favorite place in the whole world. So again, you can just imagine a person with a great imagination that just enjoys that time alone where they can be up here in their fantasies. They also have a really strong appetite for learning and information. Many type fives will actually learn new things and explore topics just for the enjoyment of doing it with no outcome or goal in mind, which is really interesting to watch uh, this desire and hunger for more information. The challenge there is it can also lead to procrastination on things that actually need to get done. So I've seen fives that say, well, I have this project at work I need to get done, but I'm so interested in this new history book I picked up that I just can't put it down and I can't get my work done. And the last thing I'll mention about type fives and uh, what I love about them is they have a really cool offbeat sense of humor that, that always uh, just catches me and, and makes me laugh. So I really do appreciate that about type fives. And in working with them, if we can help them drop down more into their emotional experience and also connect more with their body since they tend to be very cerebral, uh, they, they live up here, helping them with somatics and, and emotions can really bring more of a holistic feeling into their life um, where they don't feel that they need to be so defended and keep those boundaries and barriers up so they have more comfort within themselves. Next one here is the type six. We call this one the loyal skeptic. And David Daniels, the professor that I worked with, was a type six. And I, I love the little anecdotes that he used to share with us about his life to help us better understand his type. Their core belief is I must have a plan in order to be safe. So of all the different types, the type six is by far the most anxious of types. They worry a lot. So if you notice you're working with somebody and they tend to worry and have a lot of anxiety, could be, we could explore that they may be a type six. So you can already see the kind of fallacy and the core belief that I must have a plan in order to be safe. It really doesn't leave room for spontaneity and flexibility. So this type can feel rather rigid and kind of boxed in and have difficulty enjoying, um, you know, the fact that life is uncertain and we'll never necessarily have an answer and a plan may not work, but that's hard for a type six. So some aspects of this type is they're naturally inclined to see all the possible ways something could go wrong. So you can imagine like um, in a work setting, these people are really valuable because they can look out into the future or work working and say, oh, here's a red flag, red flag, red flag. We need to make sure we address all of these. So in many ways, this skill is very, very appreciated. We also kind of like to call them like the Boy Scout or the Girl Scout of the Enneagram because they're always prepared. Um, when they scout out all these things that could go wrong, like using their imagination to imagine we're going on a road trip, what could go wrong? I should pack extra food and water and an extra change of clothes. They're very, very prepared due to this kind of hypervigilance. Um, they do tend to appear anxious and preoccupied to others. That's one way to identify them. 
And another really beautiful aspect of the type six is they are so loyal. Um, their, their ability to maintain loyalty and create loyalty um, is just remarkable to me. Um, but that's also important to know, like in relationships and friendships, including the therapeutic relationship, if their trust is broken, it is very hard to earn back. So walk carefully and be sure to know that when you speak, you need to really speak truthfully because they have a radar for that and they really value that um, honesty and loyalty. They also like to know the rules of a situation and who's in charge, even though they may be suspicious of authority. And we're not gonna get into this today, but there are two different kinds of sixes. One is called a phobic six. So one is called counterphobic. And the counterphobic six can be a little more assertive and aggressive towards authority where they'll say, I don't trust this authority. I'm gonna you know, take advances and do my own thing or counter that authority. And they may respond in that way if they don't think the authority knows what they're doing. But nevertheless, this type likes to know the rules and whether or not they're going to follow them is a different story, but they wanna know how to play the game. And I already mentioned the part about trust, so we'll just move on from that. Um, any other things on this type? For, for client breakthroughs and working with this type, it's definitely helpful to work with their anxiety. I myself am an anxiety expert, and I use ERP, which is exposure and response therapy, um, to help my clients who deal with anxiety. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about that, you can always reach out to me. I'm happy to share resources on anxiety treatment. Next is the type seven, and this one is called the enthusiast. And the core belief of the enthusiast is I must avoid pain and frustration by keeping my options open. This type um, of all the numbers within the Enneagram comes across as the most optimistic, sunshiny, bright type. They tend to be very positively oriented, always looking at the bright side of things, the glass is half full. And anything that's frustrating or painful to them, they're gonna quickly wanna move away from. And I mean, we can all say, of course, like who doesn't want to move away from pain? But I will say there's certain numbers like the type eight, the type one, the type four, who are much more comfortable with pain and discomfort because they have an agenda, they want to get something done, or they're okay with darker emotions. So type sevens are the ones that are like, nope, I don't have any time for anger or sadness or fear. I don't want to feel those feelings and I'm going to move away from that. Um, this type really enjoys trying new things and they prioritize fun. They can sometimes look like a bit of a dilettante where they're always doing something new and they may not always complete the things that they're working on before. This type has a very, very active mind. So it's another one of the thinking types. So that was the head type of five, six, and seven. So their brain moves really, really quickly. Um, and then also in kind of a synergistic type way where they can bring together ideas that sort of didn't seem to connect, and their mind is connecting dots all the time. It's a very active mind. I mentioned they have trouble completing projects because they lose interest and move on to the, new, the next new thing. And they're also, um, when, when it comes to their optimism, they are very aware of how they're spending their time, and they just don't want to waste it on negativity. So when there's a moment, say, in a relationship where um, there's a type seven, and then their partner comes to them, and they're like, hey, there's a problem, like we need to work on this. The type seven, you'd be like, I don't wanna waste time on this. Like, can't we just be happy? Let's just go out to dinner. You know, let's just move on. Um, so I'll say when it comes to client breakthroughs with this type, helping them develop the capacity to sit with uncomfortable feelings and to realize there may actually be some really interesting things to learn there when they slow that down. Also helping them to while they prioritize fun, also prioritize how good it feels to accomplish and finish goals. So many of the sevens I've worked with will set a rule that you cannot start a new project until you finish the current project. And that helps them develop this whole internal discipline that really gives them a sense of authority that can be really wonderful for a type seven. I guess another way I like to frame it for sevens um, when, when I'm trying to encourage them to explore uh, more negative feelings like how do we how do we pitch that like how do we make that sound good is I will say um, you know if we have all the colors of a rainbow a spectrum and over here are the brighter colors we have the yellows and the pinks and the, the reds and maybe some green that's that's the life you're living it's not really a full spectrum life you're just in this one spectrum but if you really want a rich life and they do 
you want to live in full spectrum, full color life. So let's add in the blues and the purples and the, and the blacks and bring all of that in as well. And when, we, when I frame it that way, I've had more luck in enticing a seven to consider um, that journey. Next, we have the type eight, the protector. And their core belief is I must protect myself by being powerful and in control. Now this type is a quintessential masculine type, but women can be eights as well. And this type is definitely very focused on maintaining control uh, to avoid being harmed or being vulnerable. Now many of the type eights that I've worked with have a history of at some point when they were young being bullied or having their power taken away or being harmed when they felt vulnerable. And they somehow decided that's never gonna happen to me again. I'm gonna be strong and powerful and also sometimes intimidating. So this type tends to be an all or nothing type, go big or go home. Of all the numbers on the Enneagram, type eight has the biggest energy. So even if, if there's a person who's a type eight who's really small and short, when they walk into a room of people, they usually stand out in some way, they're noticed. They have a big presence, even if they have a little body. Um, this type is really focused on being strong, dependable, and honest. So that means that they may come across as a bit rough around the edges because they're just going to say what they think is true. They just want to be strong, dependable, honest, and they want to make it forthcoming and just get it out. And they really want other people to meet them in that same way. They like when people are dependable and honest and also kind of strong in their presence. So like I said, what you see is what you get. They really don't sugarcoat things. Uh, with type eights, there's none of the uh, dancing around topics or saying it gently. They tend to just come straight out with it and um, they're focused on getting things done as well. They like to move things forward. So they don't want to linger too much and take time for the niceties um, that some other types may enjoy or uh, prefer. Now this type is very focused on injustice and they believe in fighting for what's right. So many eights have a real strong sense of underdogs and wanting to help protect the underdog. Uh, they're very moved and inspired to write injustices or correct injustices. And that's one of the primary drivers that you can use when you're working with a type eight. Um, that can be really helpful motivator in, in helping them. They're very, very comfortable with conflict and they are also quick to anger which can be challenging in relationships. I've worked with quite a few couples um, that have a type eight partner and they, they complain about the anger and how, how often it happens and how uh, quickly it can spike. And with the type eight, the anger does tend to go quickly. It rises and it quickly falls and they're over it. But the partner or the other part of the relationship may be like, whoa, like I'm not over it yet. Like that was scary. So working with anger management can be very helpful for type eights and helping them understand how to better um, control and manage their anger and use assertiveness rather than anger to, to work with that emotion. And they're also really not comfortable with showing vulnerability or weakness. As I stated at the very beginning of this talk, now this type um, often has an experience in their past where they felt vulnerable or they felt weak and they just don't want to feel that again. So a big part of the growth path for this type is helping them to develop a capacity to experience their own vulnerability and weakness, um, to note that they have tender feelings, that they have a tender heart underneath that tough exterior. And there's actually so much wisdom there that when they start to lead their life and interact with others from a more vulnerable and tender place, that really transforms their relationships and, and how they feel about their life. And I've seen many eights just grow and blossom into such a, a beautiful, tender soul that's always going to be strong and assertive, but does so in a way that uh, doesn't bulldoze other people. Okay. And finally, we're coming to the type nine, and this is the peacekeeper. The peacekeeper's core belief, I'm keeping the peace, I'll be written. This type is very focused on not just inner peace, but also collective peace. So that means if like they were in a group, they would sense how everybody's feeling and want there to be a peaceful feeling within the group, within the family, as well as within themselves. Now people tend to see nines as very friendly and agreeable and easygoing. Uh, something I've had the experience of multiple times is when I've been in, I've entered into a new group, say school for instance, 
and I feel kind of nervous. I walk in, I'm like, Oh, like, where do I fit in? Um, having a nine somehow notice me in the crowd and come over and just be that friendly presence. It's like, Hey, you know, welcome to the group. And just in a very gentle, peaceful way, just noticing and noticing my discomfort and then coming over and seeking to bring some peace to that moment of tension. Um, they're also extremely good at seeing other people's points of view, which make them excellent mediators. They can be in a situation where there's 10 people arguing and they can hold space for that and just watch all the different arguments taking place and see the perspectives all is valid and even find a way to help those people mediate. And they're often not really sure of what their own needs or desires may be. And they may appear to be rather indecisive. When I was in graduate school, my best friend uh, through that program uh, was a type nine. And I remember so many instances like where I'd say, hey, you want to go get something to eat? And she'd say, yeah, but I have no idea what I want to eat. And, and it would take her so long just to even contemplate what that might be. Or if you want to see a movie, I don't even know. Like, what, 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 what am I in the mood for? I can't decide. That can be really challenging. Um, and also being so focused on other people's needs, their energy and focus is out there externally. So they don't have the bandwidth to focus in here internally to figure out what their needs are. So similar to a type two in that way, where the type two is focused on helping others, the type nine is just focused on, well, you know, what do other people's, what do other people want and expect of me in order to keep the peace? How to kind of keep the harmony here? This type tends to go along with what other people want, but sometimes this may leave them feeling a little bit resentful. And it takes nines a while to wake up to this fact. They often aren't aware of this on a conscious level. Again, uh, an example I'll give of my friend in, in college. Um, I remember once when I, we were all learning about the Enneagram together. So we kind of, I had a, my, my radar on that she was a nine and kind of observing her behavior. And I asked her one day, hey, would you like to go to a movie um, at three o'clock today? And I saw her facial expression where there was kind of this hesitation where she looked and she kind of winced a little bit. And then she went, yeah, yeah, three, that sounds good. I said, oh, really? I don't know. Are you, are you sure about that? And she's like, no, yeah, it's totally fine. I said, ah, oh, I don't know. I, I feel something here like that maybe, maybe that's not really just what you want. And she, she sits there for a moment and I can see that she's trying to check in with herself because at first she's reading me. Now she's checking in and she goes, you know, actually, yeah, like I really would rather go to a later movie because I'm really tired and I was thinking maybe I'd take a nap at that time. But if you want to go at that time, it's, it's fine and I can do it. That's a perfect example of a type nine uh, having difficulty asserting their own needs and wanting to go along with the flow of somebody else. Um, and it's because they're highly conflict avoidant, whereas the type eight, just the one before, loves conflict. They're like, bring it on. Conflict is a way to get stuff done. Type nine is like, oh my gosh, please, can we not have conflict? So they're, they'd rather um, let go of their own needs and their own agenda in order to keep conflict at bay. So when working with type nines, it's really important to help them first learn how to connect to their own inner landscape and what they're feeling. So just, just noticing, are you going along with something that you don't really want to do? Are you taking care of your needs? What are your needs? And that's the first step in the journey. And then secondary would be helping them slowly assert those needs and become more confident in their ability to deal with interpersonal conflict. And often that can take place in the therapeutic arena where we could have conflict together and learn that in this container, there is safety and we can practice together and then translate that out into their, their life with other people. I also wanted to just, before I finish with the nine types, just go back um, to type two and maybe three because I don't recall I think that I left out um, how to better work with these types when it comes to facilitating breakthroughs so with tattoos but that feeling of always needing to take care of other people first helping them slow things down a bit so that they can really sink into their own needs and address those will be really helpful Type twos tend to have more access to their inner feelings and needs than a type nine. So if you ask a type two, like, well, if you could just have like the whole week to yourself and it was all about you, 
you know, what would you want and, and what, would you, what do you need for yourself? And they can just, they can make the list. And you can help them really prioritize the things that matter most, like their top values, their top three, four, five values. And then start looking at ways to create more congruence in their life that they can start asking others to step up more and take on more responsibilities and help them a little bit while they relax back and let go of some control. And that's the hardest part for it too, is to, to learn that I won't be abandoned if I'm not always serving other people, that they actually value me and want me to be in their life just for me being me. Even if I didn't help them at all, I still have worth and value in their eyes and I'm safe. So that's something that you can work on with those clients is more self-care and, and exploring the discomfort that comes with the judgment of I'm being selfish or I'm in danger when I make time to take care of myself. And then on the type three, uh, and working with this type to help facilitate breakthroughs, oftentimes when we ask this type, you know, again, if you had, they, they go so fast, they're putting out so much energy that they feel like there's, it, it's almost, it almost feels hard and impossible to slow down and look within. Now the core issue here is around feeling that sense of worthlessness if I'm not achieving. So sometimes playing with little thought experiments, like if you're on an island where there's nothing left to achieve, there's no achievement to ever be done again, and you're just going to be on that island, who would you be? And you can also explore this, um, the shape-shifting, the chameleon nature of being a different person in different situations, and then wondering, well, but who are you when you're just all alone? Who's really in there? And starting to develop more of an internal framework that can support them when they start to focus less on achieving and getting accolades from the external world. And they can start to build a way of getting accolades from themselves internally for non-doing activities, like achieving uh, a day of laziness, achieving self-care, achieving taking a nap in the middle of the day. And there's a really cool book called The Underachievers Manifesto that you guys might wanna check out for type threes. It's just a short little book, it's wonderful. The Underachievers Manifesto. And again, you can always contact me for, um, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer those. And now I'm gonna just move back to where we were, we're bringing it to a close here shortly. So now here's something that you all can use if you are interested in exploring this in more detail yourself uh, and using this. I always recommend first that you experiment on yourself and start to learn uh, the, the Enneagram uh, as it applies to you. This book here, The Essential Enneagram, is one of the easiest ways to enter into the Enneagram. Um, there is a, you can just basically go on Amazon and find that book there. It's really short. And this is the way you can discover your personality type. And what you'll notice is that it's not a test. It's actually a self-exploration that leads you to your type. And in doing this kind of exploration, you'll naturally learn the other nine types as well. So it's just, now, from this Essential Enneagram, uh, Dr. Daniels also created an inventory or an assessment that you can use, which is a very sh a much shorter tool in order to help yourself or people uh, find their type. And so the free version here at this link, and you'll notice that it's paragraph style where each type is described in a paragraph and you would read each paragraph and you'd pick the one that feels most true to you as a, the big picture of that paragraphs. So you're not picking it apart line by line, but you're like, as a whole, paragraph three and paragraph seven, really, you know, wow, those are really me. And then you can do further reading in order to um, further delineate between the different types and home in on what your core type may be. Some additional resources, like I mentioned before, would be the Enneagram Institute is excellent and there is a book associated with them that's called The Wisdom of the Enneagram, which is a very big, thick book. If you want a deep dive, then that's um, a book that I would highly recommend. Um, and so that's all I have for you today in terms of tools and news for this in more detail. And then I have my contact information here in case you are interested in asking any questions relevant to yourself as a person or uh, your business or clients. Or again, if you want more resources, then just feel free to reach out to me and I would be more than happy to assist you. So it doesn't look like we have any questions I need to address at this time. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and bring this to a close and just remind all of you today who are um, joining us to hang out for a few minutes for that poll. Only five short questions and it really, really helps us to get that feedback. So thank you again for your time and have a great day.